All right, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to keep doing that until we're done. And we're just, uh, we would have started with uh, chapter 7 this morning. We ended chapter 6 last Sunday. But there have been a couple of times, a couple of points in the two chapters that we've covered so far where the concepts are so big, so all-encompassing, that we need to hit it again. You need to just stop for a second and just see, did you really hear what was just said? Do you, do you hear the words that are coming out of Jesus' mouth? And, and just stop for a minute and see if we can drive that point further home. And that's what I want to do this morning. Um, as much as we've talked about kingdom, or at least as much as I've talked about kingdom, and as much as you've listened about kingdom, if I asked you to give me a definition of kingdom, the way Jesus sees it, would you be able to do that? Would you be able to define what kingdom means according to Jesus' lights? And you can argue that he spent his entire ministry defining kingdom. That's what he was all about. Kingdom is the overarching metaphor that he uses. It's the structure on which he hangs all of his teaching. And so to misunderstand kingdom is to misunderstand the very lens through which Jesus is looking as he's looking at life, looking at us, looking at relationship, and looking at his ministry. So this one term, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, Abundava Shmaya, you know, is what we need to understand. I stopped and think there because really what I translated for you was our Father in heaven. <laughs> Rather than Makutha Dundavashmaya, which would be kingdom of heaven. I said, wait a minute, that didn't sound right. It had nothing to do with you all, but it derailed me for just a second there. Um, Kingdom, as Jesus understands it, is not a place, and it's not a time. It's a state of being. It's a quality of life that begins whenever we just acquiesce to allow ourselves to experience what the moment really holds, to be present to God's presence is the kingdom of God, and everything that that entails. Kingdom is the prerequisite. It is the decoder ring, if you will. It's the Rosetta Stone for all of Jesus' teaching. It really is being present to God's presence. And yet, I guarantee you, you're still struggling with this. And if you think you're not, then the journey really hasn't begun yet. You need to struggle with this. All of humanity comes from a legal perspective because that's the way the world works. It's zero sum, it's performance for something, it's entropy, there's no free lunch. Everything goes from order to disorder, so you always gotta be cleaning things up, you've always gotta be working. And so that is the lens through which we see life. Why not? It's It's the physical rule of our lives. Jesus is trying to get us to see that in spiritual matters, in terms of his Father's presence, Everything is flipped. And if we can't make that flip with him, then we are not going to be able to apprehend anything that Jesus is talking about. We will always be coming at his teaching from a literalistic, legalistic point of view, which kills everything that it means to be in kingdom. And so if you're not struggling with that, if you haven't struggled, if you haven't like run up to it and then run back again, you know, if it still isn't tweaking you, then the journey has not yet begun. And if you have crossed over to the place of actual trust in this concept of kingdom, you will know the difference. There's a different quality to life. There's a conviction that sets in that just kind of lets us be content. It allows us to let go of the fear and the anxiety that we experience so often. And then Jesus says, if you will seek this first, this quality of life, if you will allow yourself the vulnerability, if you will allow yourself the sense of dependence that comes with really being acutely aware of the kind of relationship we have with our God, then all else gets added. Everything that we need, not in the ways that we imagine them, not in the ways of acquisition necessarily, but everything we need will be added from that point. The beauty is we only have to do one thing. We don't have to do a million things. There's not a huge, complicated map to figure out. We just keep showing up to presence, and things start to happen. The details will work themselves out in real time. 
The path is made as we walk on it, right? And imagine the change that that would involve in your life if we really were working along these lines. It flies in the face of everything the world works. That's why it's so difficult for us to apprehend. And it flies in the face of everything that we know or think we know from a legal point of view. But Jesus says the waiting is over. The waiting is over. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. Mark 1.15, first thing he says in the Gospel of Mark. That means the kingdom is not fixed in time or space. It's not a place, and it's not the afterlife. It's not a when. It's always now. It can only and ever and always be now. It's whenever we decide to fall into that quality of awareness. And then he says the kingdom is within you. The word he uses there, entos in Greek, within, among, in the midst of. Legao men in Aramaic, moving dynamically from inside out. Luke 17. Once again, not out there fixed in time and space. It is a state of being that we carry around with us wherever we go, whenever we go, if we really are moving in that direction. So if kingdom is not a place, that means it's not heaven. We think of kingdom in the, in the modern West as heaven. It's not heaven. It's not a place. It's not afterlife. So it's not future, not time or space. If we can actually start to get that concept, it changes everything. It changes everything about the way that we experience life. Now, what brings us in or takes us out of kingdom? Well, the first thing Jesus said was, you got to be born again. You want to be in kingdom? you got to be born again. And, of course, we have a million different definitions of what that means. But the simplest is that we are born again to a new way of seeing. Everything that we had built up in our lives to that point that is our security, that is our reliance, we let go. We let fall. And then whatever's last left, I guess as Sherlock Holmes said, right? When you've gone through every, all the impossible, you know, whatever is left, however impossible, must be the truth. It's kind of like that. You let go of everything. What is left? No matter how amazing it would seem that God's love is this inclusive, that God's love is this absolute, it must be true. To be born again to that is to let everything else go and move into this new place. What did Jesus say would take you out of kingdom? Well, he said, if, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter kingdom. Because as long as you are equal with their righteousness, which is all legal, just following the law to the nth degree, never graduating into beyond the law, beyond mere obedience, you can't enter. So he's trying to get us to, again, take that normal viewpoint and turn it around 180 degrees. And he said, unless you can become like one of these children, you can't enter the kingdom. And the child is the epitome of that born-againness that we were just talking about. Jesus is very poetic in this, right? You must be born again. Your righteousness must exceed what you normally see every single day of your life. You must become like one of these. Paul is much more prosaic, right? Paul just says, hey, man, you know, if you're a murderer, if you're a fornicator, if you are evil, <laughs> he doesn't say evil exactly. He says, if you're envious, if you're jealous, if you're a gossip or a slanderer, you're not going to get into the kingdom. Now, it, that all just to blow me away. How can Paul put out a laundry list like that that puts murderers and gossips on the same plane? How does that work? How could that possibly be? Because we're thinking legally. Once again, we're thinking, oh, being a gossip damns us to hell and keeps us from heaven because we're still thinking of the kingdom as heaven. But as soon as you translate kingdom back into what Jesus is talking about, a gossip is just as surely out of the connection, out of the quality of life, out of the type of relationship that kingdom is all about, as a murderer, you cannot live this quality of life and be so disconnected from your fellow brothers and sisters that you would slander them, that you would treat them this way. It is not possible. 
Because it's not obedience that gets us into the kingdom. It's obedience that flows from the experience of kingdom. There's a huge, huge difference here. Our behavior doesn't damn us or save us at all. That's a legal attitude. Our behavior, though, does allow us to begin to see God's presence everywhere in everything that we do. That's very different as well. This whole grace versus works debate that is always going on perennially in the church, that just evaporates in the face of all of this. Because works aren't the cause of grace. Works are the effect of the experience of grace. Just as we said. Once again, back to front, Jesus is always trying to get us to see things. And if we can start to see this idea of kingdom the way Jesus does, then God's love, God's perfect love, remains uncompromised. And we start to understand that it's always there. There's never a moment that it's not. It precedes us wherever we go. It's simply waiting to be seen. It's waiting for us to realize that it is there, that we can move into that. We can be part of that. Because legally, we think if we just do good, if we do right now, then we get to go to heaven later, right? Then we get to go to kingdom later, if then. But Jesus is telling us, as long as that kind of thinking is motivating you, in other words, as long as you're operating on either reward or punishment, you can never enter. And remember, it's not really a place. He means you can never experience, you can never realize this quality of life, this way of relating to God. It is not quid pro quo. We don't do something in order to get something. It's not contractual. We don't sign on the bottom line, and God is obligated to do things for us as long as we don't break the contract. It's not an investment. It's not a tax. It's not an obligation, and it's not a duty. It has nothing to do with obedience. It has to do with a transformation that will make our lives look like law in the sense of not stepping on each other's toes. But it's much more than that. Much more than that. The good that we do in life has to be and has to become its own reward right now, right here, or it absolutely does us no spiritual good. How many times did Jesus said, if you do it this way, you have your reward in full. Whatever material gain you achieved, that's it. It does no more spiritual good. It does physical good, possibly, to those who are the receiver of our good works. But for us personally, if we are doing it with this idea of reward or a tax or an obligation or a duty, we're done. There is no more kingdom to be had. The connection, the acceptance, as Richard Bohr would say, the task within the task that we experience while we're doing those good things, while we're doing things for someone else, that is kingdom. The acceptance, the connection that we experience is kingdom. We are kingdom when we are accepting and connecting in these moments. There is no more reward than that because kingdom is always here. Kingdom is always now. That's it. It's self-contained. Can that be all right with us? Can that be enough for us? See where the struggles are? When we learn to love that connection, that acceptance more than our own lives, then we are kingdom itself. Jesus said there's no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend, and that doesn't mean to die physically. It means to lay down your ego position in a billion different ways, in an unlimited number of ways, in favor of relationship because you love that relationship so much. Nothing will keep you from it. Knowing this deep meaning of kingdom changes everything. And that's what Jesus is after for us, to have us change everything, to move from a fear base to a love base and have everything changed. But it can't do that until it's experienced. This mental understanding, what we're trying to do right now to get a mental concept is not going to be enough. 
If this concept seems right enough to you, if you think that maybe you could survive trying it in your life, then when you go out that door, implement it, experience what it does for you, then you're moving on the road to kingdom. But only then. Thinking about it is all just preparation. It can show us the door, but we've got to walk through. And Jesus is hammering this point home at every opportunity. Every frame of the Gospels is Jesus trying to get this across. And once you see kingdom in the way we're talking about, you see Jesus working so hard in things that seem unrelated, but they, they come right back in some way, shape, or form to this aspect of living life changed. Take a look. We read these last week, but let's just go over them again because it's important for us to see. Matthew 5:25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more, worth more than food and the body worth more than clothing? Now we said these are four different verses, four different concepts, illustrations that Jesus gives us. But each one, as I was pointing out, and if you're looking at your inserts, there is something tangible that we can do if we really are truly engaged, if we are desirous of experiencing this kingdom, the first thing we said was to look deeper, look beneath just the facade, look beneath the skin of life around us. The world that we can see, the visible world, the seen world is just the covering. There is this whole unseen world that is the reality that we can experience like dual sight, if we are willing to start to look deeper. And Jesus is getting this across. You're so worried about the surface things, what you will wear, what you will eat, but your body is worth more than clothes. Your life is worth more than food. Can you start to look deeper? Can you see the task within the task, the connection, the awareness, that, that universal connection that undergirds everything that you do? Infinite numbers of ways that we can experience this, but can we look deeper? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And we talked about this. Birds are working constantly. It's not that they don't work, but they don't work for the future. They don't store things up. Stay present. Stay present to this moment. If all of our focus is on the future, if everything is on what we store up, if everything is about calculating whether we're now saved and into heaven and avoiding hell, then we are missing the only place that we can ever experience kingdom starting now. And the only place that we'll ever experience kingdom after death, by the way, because there's only one now, eternally. And if we haven't learned how to be present, how to find God here and now, do we really think we're automatically going to do it in the next life? Paul said we can rule and reign with God if we can start to get this concept now. Rule and reign over whom? Those who still need a hand at the small of their back, obviously. Stay present. Verse 27, and who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life or a single inch or foot to his stature? Either one is a viable translation to that. And then right after that in Luke, Luke's version, he says, if you can't control the smallest things in life, how do you think you can control the rest? We need to accept our vulnerability. We need to accept our utter dependence on God. Look deeper. Stay present. Accept your vulnerability. Actually, rejoice in your vulnerability. Haven't you seen the boss's job? Do you really want it? Would you want that kind of responsibility, all those details to have to constantly think about? If we could just get into the present, stay present, accept our vulnerability, show up to the moment, and let God be God. Let the world turn without us tonight. How would that change things? And then finally, starting at verse 28. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, they don't spin, yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, 
will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, in other words, those who do not know our God, those who stand outside our experience, eagerly seek after all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. These four points, this last one, see the perfection in the moment. Let the moment be enough. Don't keep thinking that something has to be added or subtracted for this moment to be what it needs to be. Don't see this moment as simply the stepping stone, the means to another end, another outcome that will be perfect. That's chasing the horizon. See the perfection that is right here before you, the completeness, the fullness, the enoughness, and everything begins to change. Look deeper, stay present, accept your vulnerability, see the perfection in the moment. Four points that can order our daily activities, that can become part of our daily activities, that can deepen our awareness over time to start to bring kingdom into focus. Gradually, deepening our experience of kingdom and bringing a growing conviction that this is really what our purpose is here. This is our meaning. This is our identity. And then coming all the way back to the top of the Sermon on the Mount, the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which was, we said, a picture of the finished product. Let's recall what Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, starting at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And even though that denotes to possession, it's not really possession. The poor in spirit are the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said of the children, such as these are kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they are the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted who recognize their vulnerability, right? If you're mourning, aren't you recognizing your vulnerability? Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Every one of these points to vulnerability. Every one of these points to a sense of dependence. Beautiful dependence, though. Not a dependence that leads to resentment, but an acceptance which is the best definition of humility, the acceptance of our actual condition, the acceptance of our actual relationship. It points to an openness and an open connection with those around. And as a further illustration of how deep this rabbit hole can go and what it really means to change everything, when Jesus says we must be like little children to enter, in other words, such as these are the kingdom He's basically saying unless we can adopt such an attitude to learn to love the experience of being vulnerable. Now, there's a tough one. How many of you love the experience of being vulnerable? When has vulnerability ever done you any good, right? But unless we can learn to love the experience of vulnerable connection, to realize there is no connection without vulnerability until we drop our shields, until we acquiesce and realize, yes, we're going to be hurt again if we become vulnerable. Are we willing to do that? To learn to love that condition is to enter the kingdom. And we will never experience kingdom now or then if we can't, if we don't. But like the kingdom concept itself, how hard is it to really let this idea of vulnerability sink in? How hard is that? Vulnerable connection is kingdom. It's another way to define it, if you would like. What is kingdom? It's a quality of life that is vulnerable connection. People willing to be open, hurtable, so that they can be in relationship. But this will take everything in you to accept fully. You can't leave anything on the table. Jesus said, you got to be willing to sell everything that you own if you want to follow me. 
Now, that doesn't mean that some, things, some of those things won't come back to you, but you don't know which ones. you got to be willing to let it all go, to become completely vulnerable again, completely dependent again, like Adam and Eve who didn't know they were naked in the garden, in order to be able to start again, be born again, and move into a different kind of relationship. Now, here's the truth. Our society despises vulnerability. Would you agree with that? Despises vulnerability. Despises weakness. Despises imperfection. Everything about our society is geared in the other direction because we, as individuals, are terrified of vulnerability. We work our entire lifetimes to try to erase any kind of imperfection, imperfection, any kind of vulnerability, anything that would make us less than in our own minds, right? And we build up our idea of security. We build up our idea of power. But any security or power that we build up in our lives is simply illusion. It's not real. What did Jesus say? You can't add a single hour to your life. You can't add an inch to your stature. If you can't handle the little things, if you have no power there, what is it you exactly think that you can accomplish here on your own? To accept this is completely different, but it is terrifying for us to realize that we are just helplessly sitting on this ball spinning in space. Can't control much of anything. We're just, in fact, you know what the best thing we can do is? Enjoy the ride. <laughs> you're on a ride, you know? Maybe you think your seatbelt's on, but you're on a ride. And that's all we can do. What do you really think that you can create in terms of your own power, in terms of your own security? We can enjoy the ride. What Jesus is saying is that we need to stop. We need to quiet down. You know the four S's that we've been talking about? Solitude, silence, stillness, simplicity. What does it say behind me? Be still. Silence, solitude, stillness, simplicity. To just allow ourselves to go down to that ground zero. Allow ourselves to just let all the air out of the tires, out of the balloon, out of our illusions that we have built something that we think adds an hour to our life, and to learn to love that place, that begins to change everything. We got to deeply consider our actual relationship to life, to God, to each other. We have to deeply consider what the human condition is really all about. Because if we can't accept who we really are as human beings, how in the world can we experience kingdom? Which is the trust that lets go of all the anxiety and allows us to simply be content in all our circumstances. Now, I'm a fan of Brene Brown, and I know a lot of you are as well. And uh, years ago, you know, when she did all of her research, and uh, she began writing her books, and she did a TED Talk on the power of vulnerability. And I wanted to read to you just a, a little edit from that talk, because it's brilliant, you know. And the beautiful thing about Brene Brown is that she's not coming from a faith base. She's coming from science. She's coming from, you know, she's a social worker. She's a researcher. And she's coming from that world. She's just interviewing people. She's seeing what makes them tick. And after interviewing hundreds of people over years and years, she had compiled enough data to start to become convinced of something. And here's what she said in part. She says, I started with connection because by the time you're a social worker for 10 years, what you realize is that connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. It's what it's all about. The ability to be connected is why we're here. You want a purpose to your life? Have you ever defined what the purpose of your life is? I think she did it right there. But she didn't do it in, well, she did it in her own isolation. She had to do the work to come to the doorstep of what she believes. But she could have just read the Gospels as well if she wanted to. I love how science and 
scripture, science, and spirituality finally connect. Take some time for science to catch up what the spirit can intuitively leap to sometimes. But it's all about connection. That's it. Kingdom is connection. And you can't be connected without being vulnerable. So what does she say? But very quickly, so she knows that connection is, is it, right? But very quickly, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. That's not bad. The fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection? It's universal. We all have it. This, I'm not good enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. It was excruciating vulnerability. This idea of, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. Now, here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. What shame is, how it works. If I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that th that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness, who have a strong sense of love and belonging, and folks who struggle for it, folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated them. People who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. The only thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection. Now, what do these people have in common? The ones that feel worthy of connection, right? What they had in common was a sense of courage. These folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. See where this is going? They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were. You absolutely have to do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common was this. They fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. How about that for changing everything? They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor did they really talk about it being excruciating. They just talked about it being necessary. They talked about the willingness to say, I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willingness to breathe through waiting for the doctor to call you after your mammogram. They were willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought. This was fundamental. And it is. It changes everything. If we can really hear it. Now, it's what Jesus has been saying all along. But science and us, sometimes from a secular point of view, have to catch up to what is going on here and to realize the same thing. If kingdom is now, not then, if it's a quality of life, now, not a reward later, not a payment later, not heaven later, that changes everything. It changes our worldview. It changes our mindset from legal to relational, from fear, which is typically fear of punishment, to love. If we are already worthy of connection, if we really are already worthy of connection, there's with nothing to prove, right? Nothing to earn. That changes everything. Think about how much time you spend trying to prove yourself worthy. Think about the things that you do. Think about all the worrying of what other people are thinking about you. You spend spinning around in your head and how that causes you to react. Think about how much time you spend creating the projection, the facade of what you're going to show everybody as soon as you walk out the door. Self-consciously wondering if you've been successful enough to keep them from seeing the things that you never want anybody to see. 
But if we're already worthy of connection, that changes everything. If we can start from a point of abundance, not need, exactly as Jesus is teaching us, if we can stop striving for what we already possess, oh my gosh, that changes everything. If what makes us vulnerable actually does make us beautiful, make us lovable, make us connectable, I guarantee you, think about people from your past. Think about people, your friends in school, growing up. The most lovable things about them, the things that make you smile, the things that you want to tell other people about, are going to be the weirdnesses of them. It's going to be their imperfections. It's going to be their eccentricities. It's going to be the way they snorted when they laughed. It's going to be whatever. But those are the things that connect us as human beings. Think about someone that you think is absolutely perfect. Because as long as you can think they're absolutely perfect, you really don't have that much of a relationship with them. You can have that kind of relationship with an author or a politician, maybe. Well, maybe politician is out the door. But you won't be close to them. Because as soon as you get close to someone, you see their imperfections. And you're either OK with that, and you can live through that, and you can breathe through that, and you can see it as a reflection of your own imperfections or not. And if you do, if you can, that's what makes us beautiful lovable, connectable, that we're peers, that we can actually share this existence with each other. If we can do that, if we believe that what makes us vulnerable makes us beautiful and lovable and human, then we will be able to accept and love and connect with imperfect people around us. And not a moment before. And beyond that, we'll be able to know how God loves us as imperfect people. We will understand how this love really works, and that changes everything. Now, children do this all naturally because they can't do anything else. They're kids. They haven't learned what adults know yet. They have no concept of past or future. Everything is now. Ever tried to tell a two-year-old or a three-year-old that you're going to Disneyland tomorrow? Don't do that. They will be following you around. Are we going now? Are we going now? Are we going tomorrow? Now? Tomorrow? Now? Eh, there's just no tomorrow. There's just now. No concept of past or future. No concept of shame. They don't know they're naked. I remember when Brennan was little, you know? I actually mourned the first day he closed the bathroom door to go pee. He's not in the garden anymore. He knows he's naked. You know, kids don't know this. They have no concept of imperfection. There is this ongoing ad. It's the longest ad in the world. But it's from Shriners Hospital that Marion and I have been seeing. And, but you know what? I love it every time I see it. It's all these little kids you know, that are in the hospital. And they're, of course, they're soliciting funds. But there's kids with, with one leg gone. And this little girl with a pogo stick for a leg is running down the hall of the hospital, just ah, having the best old time. They have all these different types of diseases, and they're smiling, shaved heads. They're smiling. They're laughing. You know, and this little, little kid is saying, it's the best part of my day when I go to the hospital because I get to see my friends, and I get to see the doctors who take care of me as his mother has to lift him from the bed into the wheelchair and from the wheelchair into the car. They don't know they're imperfect. They're just being who they are. They have no shame. These things that are imperfect in them, they don't calculate to make them unworthy of connection. They will as they get older, but they don't right now. Kids are blissfully happy until we teach them not to be. And that's the truth of it. And that's what Jesus is trying to point out to us. Don't keep the children from me. Let them come, for such as these are kingdom. Don't you get it? Don't you see why I'm here? It's not to keep these things at bay. It's not to build some ivory tower edifice. It's to roll in the dirt with these kids and enjoy this moment right now, because this is kingdom. It doesn't get any more kingdom than this. Whatever you're looking for, stop. If you can't find it here, you won't find it anywhere 
or any when. It is not possible. And so the question I suppose we need to ask ourselves is, can we re-enter this childlike state, which is the definition of being born again? What's left, right? Can we re-enter that childlike state that has, doesn't have the concept or the fixation, at least, on past and future and shame and imperfection? Yeah, we can do it. If we couldn't, Jesus wouldn't have been barking up that particular tree. He wouldn't be leading us down this path. He doesn't tell us we can do something only to be frustrated. And he's not telling us that only he can do something and we just have to come under his covering. He's telling us you need to engage. It's to your advantage that I go so that you can interface directly with the Spirit and find the empowerment that allows you to do exactly this, to put down your fear, your risk enough to take the first tentative steps that will move you into the experience that changes everything. Yes, we can do it, but it's not going to happen all at once. It's okay if kingdom has been a moving target for you. It's okay if you run out into the surf and as soon as the wave comes, run back to your mom's lap. It's okay. That is the experience of it because it doesn't happen all at once. It happens bit by bit, choice by choice, awareness by awareness, moment by moment as we choose, as we experience we're just adding more and more to the sense of conviction that we are growing from inside out. And with Jesus' concepts in our hands and in our head, we can order the choices of our lives to look deeper, to experience life as both a combination of seen and unseen, and to realize that the unseen part is what gives the seen life its meaning and purpose its color, to stay present, to bring our minds back when they have wandered off and are disallowing us to be able to experience this moment, to not let our thoughts and emotional triggers destroy the enoughness of this moment right now, to accept our vulnerability, to make our vulnerability a badge of honor, of our humanity, knowing that what makes us vulnerable does make us beautiful, lovable, connectable, accessible, and to see the perfection of each moment, the abundance that all we need is already here, not in the way we imagine it necessarily, but it's already here if we will just take it and run with it, you know? To see this quality of living moments going after these moments, this idea of kingdom first, so that all else can be added. This is the way of Jesus. This is the only way to the Father. The only way. We would like there to be a kinder and gentler way that doesn't require us to let go of all of our illusions. But there is no other way. Jesus says this straight out. This is it. You want to follow me? Do you want to find this level of freedom, trust, conviction? This is what it looks like. But it starts with understanding who we are from God's point of view. That even in our vulnerability and even in our perfection, we are already worthy of the connection, of the love, of the acceptance, of the grace. There is nothing else except that we're here breathing that qualifies us for God's love and God's connection. And in the beautiful words of Thomas Merton, when he had his transcendent experience on the corner of 4th and Walnut in downtown Louisville all those years ago, he said, what if we all could understand that we're all walking around shining like the sun? What if we actually could see that? That in God's eyes, each one of us is a light. Each one of us is absolutely worthy. Each one of us can enter kingdom at any moment we choose. That changes everything. Let's pray. Father, it just seems too much 
it seems that it's too good to be true. It seems that it must be harder than this. It, there must be something we need to do, conform to, obey. When we move into that frame of mind, when we feel our thoughts going into that place, when we feel the fear or the self-consciousness creep up because we're afraid again of our inadequacies, help us to bring something to mind that we've talked about here this morning, something to mind that Jesus talks about constantly that will give us just the first toehold to be able to move in a different direction, to choose beyond our shame, to choose connection even before we're fully believing that we're worthy of it, but to choose it anyway so that we can experience that we are. Whatever it takes, Lord. However frightening it may be at first, that's what we're praying for. Those moments where we realize that we have a choice to make and we can choose the connection of kingdom and we will not be denied by you. To know that, that's our prayer, Father, this morning. And thank you for living this reality eternally so that we can approach you anytime that we are fearless enough. Your love, your constancy, and realizing that any love that we see, any love that we can be a part of, engage, is only because you did it first. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.